السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We commence with the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى the Lord of the worlds, the creator of entire creation we send blessings and salutations upon the greatest of all creation Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest and the highest in status, not only from all of mankind, but even the messengers that Allah sent, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was granted the highest status. And we are fortunate to be from his ummah, to be from those who follow his instruction completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us steadfast and may he make it easy for us to follow the footsteps of this greatest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ameen. My brothers, my sisters, we are in the months of Hajj. And Hajj, as you know, is the fifth pillar of Islam. And Hajj, as you know, is not compulsory except upon those who can afford the trip who manage to go, who have the permission to go, etc. Certain conditions need to be met, and then it becomes compulsory. If those conditions are not met, then it's not compulsory. For example, a person cannot afford it, then it would not be compulsory. A person is unable to travel for some reason, it's not compulsory. A person is not given permission to go in terms of perhaps visa and in terms of authority not allowing that travel for some reason it becomes not compulsory and that is from the Quranic verse وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it incumbent incumbent upon us that we fulfill Hajj, meaning Hajj has been made compulsory for the one who can afford, for the one who can manage. Istita'a actually means ability. So the affording of it from a financial perspective is only one aspect of it. Then from a health perspective, then from the authorities, etc., etc. However, what we need to realize is why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make Hajj at one time? Everyone has to go in the month of Dhul Hijjah to Mina and then to Arafah and then to Muzdalifa and then back to Mina and Pelt. All the people have to do it at one time. Why didn't he say, you can go at any time that is convenient to you? Yes, Umrah you could. Umrah is the minor or the lesser pilgrimage. We call it the lesser pilgrimage because there is no English word that describes the word Umrah of Arabic. So Allah says when it comes to Hajj, there is a specific time that all of you will do Hajj. Anyone who goes on another day or another month, it's not accepted. It's not considered Hajj. The same applies to Ramadan. It's one month of the year. Allah didn't say, okay, you've got to fast 29 or 30 fasts. Each one of you can do it when it's convenient for you. No, Allah says, this is the month. You see the moon, you fast. You see the moon, you have Eid. I want to take it further. This act of worship we have right now, Jumu'ah, there is a specific time within which it must be fulfilled. On a specific day of the week, why did Allah decide that it has to be at a certain time, a certain day, when it comes to Jumu'ah, when it comes to Ramadan, certain time frame, when it comes to Hajj, certain place, certain time? Have you ever thought of it? Because He wants us to be together as an Ummah. He wants us to be together as an Ummah. He wants us to recognize each other, to realize that you are but a number. To realize that the arrogance, the haughtiness, the pride, the wealth, the authority, the looks, everything becomes irrelevant. You are in the saf, in salah. You are standing with whoever is next to you. You do not choose. You don't book a seat in a masjid. You don't. 
The only time that you have a place that may be reserved for those of knowledge or those who have memorized the Quran is right behind the Imam because the Prophet ﷺ says that behind me should be those with intellect, those with knowledge. So that's why sometimes you find the month of Ramadan or on a Friday, some of the days they have a few spaces that they might say, please don't sit here. This is, this is for the Imams and various other knowledgeable people, etc. Because the Prophet ﷺ has instructed that. And in case the Imam makes a mistake, someone needs to correct him. In case the Imam breaks his wudu and walks away, someone who knows what to do thereafter and how to continue should be right behind so they can carry on. Subhanallah. It's amazing. But otherwise, no booking of space. Why? Because you are just like everyone else. What happens in Hajj? Everyone has to wear the same clothing. Everyone. Especially the men. The women have restrictions, but they are much broader. Mashallah, broader restrictions, which means certain things like gloves, etc., etc. You may be told you're not allowed to do this and that, and you're not allowed to apply this or do whatever else. But when it comes to men, even the cloth that you wear, there is a restriction governing that particular cloth, clothing. So no one can say, hey, my ihram is Levi's. Have you heard that one? Levi's, ihram. Wow. Think of another brand. Gucci. Ihram. Have you seen a Gucci? I won't be surprised if people do have their little tags. But it's bogus. You know that, isn't it? It's a fake. It must be simple, straightforward. My brothers and sisters, sometimes when we think of Hajj, we just think, oh wow, it's a pilgrimage. We'll do it once in our lifetimes. Some people save for it. Some don't even save for it. When you begin to save and put away money for Hajj, it's a sign that your level of connection with Allah is getting somewhere meaningful. How many of you, young, when you start earning, you put aside 100 rands a month towards your Hajj? What will happen? In a year, you got 1,000, 10 years, 10,000. I hope the travel agents here won't rip you off by that time, subhanallah. At the moment, it's still okay, inshallah. It's affordable. Because I was speaking to one of them and I said, but brother, why does it keep going up? He says, well, it goes up there. It has to go up here as well. Because the more we save, the more it's just going. It's like you're reaching out to something. You know, when there's a little child and you're trying to reach out and you want to get them somewhere, you keep pulling it, pulling it back until you get them to where they want. We saved 10,000, it became 12,000. We saved 12,000, it became 15,000. When is it going to stop? Subhanallah. I pray that Allah make it easy for us. So this agent was very intelligent. You know what he told me? He says, well, it's not farad if you can't afford it. So if it keeps going up, it's just not farad on you. You have to be wealthy to be able to go. But my brothers and sisters, you have to try to save up for that hajj, inshallah. Yes, there are necessities, your food, your accommodation, etc., etc. But... You have your savings. You need to make sure that you want to fulfill one of these pillars of Islam. One of these pillars of Islam. And when you go, there is something unique. You will meet people from all over the world. That's one of the benefits of having it at the same time. So as much as we think, oh, we are religious people, we're reading salah, you are going to meet people who are really religious. As much as you think you fulfill the rights of your parents, you will see an old man carrying an even older woman. And he says, that's my mother. How old are you? He says, I'm about 70. And how old's your mother? She's 95. 70 year old man carrying his mother. What happened? You were reminded that no matter how much you are doing for your parents, there are others who do more. That's the benefit of going together. You see people, how they get along, how they talk, and people watch you as well. Sometimes they thank Allah they're not as bad as you and I because we have bad behavior sometimes. We get upset. Why? The chips that they fried is not crispy. Allahu Akbar, Hajj, come on. Come on, you're talking of Hajj. And the people look at you and they start laughing. Hey, you're talking of chips, man. Subhanallah. We're in Hajj. So people learn others. We get to see what's the priority of a person. That's why I always tell those going in Hajj that there is a great chance that what you have been spoilt regarding in your life, Allah is going to take that away during your blessed journey to show you 
you're going to do this without that. So if you're spoiled regarding space and you have a home where you have one bed and space for 10 other beds that you actually just sit and lounge around, you have lovely, spacious homes. When you get there, you might just have such a small room. That's Allah. He's watching. We took away one thing you were accustomed to. Now we get angry, we roll our sleeves up, go to the people downstairs or go to the agents or whoever else it was. And we start screaming and yelling and shouting and swearing. Whereas the hadith says and the Quran speaks about those who go for hajj, the characteristics need to be of a very high level. You're not supposed to swear or be abusive or commit immorality. That's when you will come back a clean person. But when you went, we tested you with just, it was a bed, but it was just a little bit of less space. You couldn't perhaps put your bags the way you would at home. Yes, if you were ripped off, my brothers and sisters, you have every right to take it up. But respectfully, brother, you cheated me. I need a better room. Subhanallah. You might not even want to say you cheated me. You say, look, my brother, if you go back to the record, I paid for this room, but you didn't give me this room. You gave me another room. Perhaps you'd like to rectify the error. And maybe if you cannot, perhaps you might consider refunding. I remember once there was a haji saying, you know what? My agent's giving me a whole refund. I said, you might have to make your haji again. <laughs> Actually, he doesn't have to. From, from a ruling perspective, he doesn't have to. But I was, act I was just trying to, you know, joke with him to make him think, oh, no. So should I just give him the money back? You know, <laughs> subhanallah. Imagine if you were to get a refund for the hajj. It's a question that would come to your mind. Do I now need to go back? The answer is no, you did the hajj. If someone gave you a refund when you did hajj and there was a mess, one of the owners, well, one of the managers of one of the hotels told me, and I'm going to say it because it did happen. He says, you come from South Africa. Uh, you know, some people don't know the difference. Zimbabwe, South Africa, it's all in Southern Africa. So I look at him and say, yeah, okay. He says, you know, you guys, you bring cockroaches in lunch tins. I said, why? He says, I've had so many cases of people who come and they say cockroaches. They're all South Africans. He says they open the, the, the lunch tin and they release the cockroaches into the room and then they get a full refund of whatever's happening. I said, hey, I hope that's not the case. I'm a Zimbabwean, by the way. <laughs> but if that's the case, I, I hope it's not true. I actually spoke to him. I told him, I don't think so. Perhaps there are cockroaches in your hotel, you know. He says, we fumigated the thing. I said, look, you better get it checked because nowadays, you know, as man advances, man advances, these mosquitoes and cockroaches, they also advance. You know, flies could never fly backward. They could always fly forward. Nowadays, they're flying backward. I mean, they, they, there's some advancement. I wonder how, but some form of advancement. The same applies to the mosquitoes. Subhanallah. They're becoming resilient. And they're becoming, you know, different breed altogether. But the same applies to us. Man, when we develop, think of it. Are you developing solely for your survival on earth or are you also developing because you'd like to build your hereafter? Ask yourself. The difference between a believer and a non-believer is that a believer is focused upon the hereafter more than upon this life. Notice I said more than, which means you are allowed, you have to. You have to have some form of actions, deeds, work, etc. to make you or to allow you to survive on earth, to live comfortably to a degree where you don't compromise halal and haram, but your main priority is the hereafter. It's the focus on the hereafter. Now we met in Hajj, mashallah, all together. So I met people from Africa, I meet people from Australia, from Europe, I meet people from India and Pakistan, Indonesia, South America, North America, you name it, they are there. They are there. The Ummah. The Ummah. As weak as we have become because of our disunity, Allah is showing us if you are united, look at the strength. Look at the strength. Have you noticed something? When you go for Hajj, you're in a haram. Everyone is focused on something. No one starts asking you, tell me something. What sect do you belong to? Tell me something. Which madhab do you follow? Tell me something. 
How do you read your salah? This way, that way. Because if you read it that way, I'm not going to give you the water. No one does that. It becomes irrelevant because we're all in hajj, which means I'm a Muslim for me to have been there in the first place. May Allah grant us an understanding. We will have differences. And I have said this so many times. We will because we are human. What you are convinced by, I may be totally convinced by something else. But Allah is going to ask me and ask you separately. And he's going to judge us separately. Allah is not going to judge you based on what I thought of you. Nor will he judge me based on what you thought of me. But Allah will judge me based on what he knows about me. And the same to you. So there is scope for difference of opinion in Islam. There is scope. We will have differences. We don't need to give up what we are not convinced or what we are convinced by. We don't need to give it up. And what we are not convinced by, we don't need to adopt it. If someone cannot prove to you from what Allah and his messenger have said, and you are not convinced by it, you don't have to change your life. And you can answer to Allah. That's the beauty. But I still love you. You know why? In essence, you are trying to please Allah. In essence, I'm trying to please Allah. In essence, I'm trying to follow the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the same applies with you. So this is why when we have differences amongst us, we should learn a lesson just from the Hajj. There are so many other lessons we can learn. But from the Hajj, that we are all together and we are different people with our differences. Nobody's compromising what they actually firmly believe. But... They are respecting the other because the objective of fulfilling the Hajj in the specific time frame is what everyone has in common. I need to get it done. If you see an old man struggling, you're not going to look at him and say, what's your sheikh's name? No, you, I can leave you struggling. You walk away. No, it's such a silly question. Such a silly question. I worship Allah. My sheikh is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm following Allah. I'm here on Hajj, the pillar of Islam. Salah, if someone says, please give me a space to fulfill Salah. When you give that person a space to fulfill Salah, you are getting a full reward of a Salah that is fulfilled because you facilitated it. When someone asks for a lift to go to the masjid, if you give them that lift, you get a full reward for whatever goodness they did in the masjid because you facilitated it. When you help someone, why does Allah love you so much? Because if Allah wanted, that person would not need that help from you or from anyone else. But Allah just gave you a chance. He showed you someone looking just like you. They have hands, they have eyes, they have a nose, they have a mouth, they have so much just like you. They have parents, they may or may not have children or spouses or siblings, but you are just like them in creation. Do you care for them? Once you prove you care for them, you arrive on a newer level in your relationship with Allah. That's why when you save one life, the Quran tells you it is equivalent to you having saved entire humanity. You passed the test. What was the test you passed? Your heart was clean enough to save a soul. And that verse where Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَنَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Whoever saves it, it is what? A soul. Allah didn't say a Muslim. Allah didn't say a person from your tribe. Allah didn't say a person who thinks like you. Allah says a soul. You save a life. It is equivalent in reward and in meaning to having saved entire humanity because number one, Reward I know I will get from Allah. But I've started a trend that if this happens, I must save the person. If this happens, we must all try to save the person. Subhanallah. 
how much do we have in common? When people speak of unity, sometimes that word is such, it's been used so much and explained in so many different ways that people get irritated. They don't want to hear that anymore. What unity, unity? What are you talking unity? You know why? Because we've confused, as I've said earlier in other lectures, we've confused unity with uniformity. We think if we're the same, we're united. I'm telling you, when we're different, we are united. As long as we respect each other, we're united. Subhanallah. Unity doesn't mean you need to be the same. Like I said, we are going for Hajj, but we're all different. We, are, we have a purpose, we're all different. Who wants Jannah? Everyone will put up their hands. But to get to Jannah, there are a million ways. The deeds I do may be different from the deeds you do. Yes, the pillars will overlap, but everything else, perhaps it won't. But you will go to Jannah and so will I, by the mercy of Allah. You work towards it. Don't think for a moment that Jannah is yours and yours alone. Jannah belongs to all of us because it belongs to he who made us. He will give it to us through his mercy. When your heart is good enough to be able to look at someone you dislike and you say, oh Allah, guide them so that they can have Jannah as well. You've now arrived at another level. But when you start despising them, belittling them, abusing them, swearing them, insulting them, that is the root of disunity. When you have a difference, you will still remain respectful because you are a Muslim. You need to respect yourself to begin with and then everybody else. The problem with us, we use language that proves that we don't respect ourselves. Young people, old people as well. Subhanallah. We hear new swear words. New swear words. We don't even know they were swear words. We might even say thank you because we don't know what they're saying. But it makes us cheap. If I were to utter a vulgar word, it wouldn't even suit my face. If you were to utter a vulgar word, go, in, go stand in front of the mirror at home and say the same, Astaghfirullah, but I mean say the same word again in front of the mirror, like you're telling it to yourself. Look at your face. And look at how you're saying it. If you have a droplet of Iman within you, you will tell yourself, this doesn't suit a mu'min. Because the hadith says a mu'min is not vulgar. Not abusive. Don't say hurtful words. Many of us, we make those we are living with suffer just because we think we have a bit of authority. That's it. Allah is watching. You will never get away. Never. He's going to take it from you. You will see the wrath of your actions, your bad actions. It's going to come. Give it a bit of time. You better repent before that day comes. So we have the beautiful Hajj. I know you may have heard and you probably will still hear more lectures about Hajj because it's the season. But I pray that those who go for Hajj really and truly come back with a Hajj Mabrur. I mean, what is a Hajj Mabrur? It is a Hajj that was accepted by Allah to the degree that the person returns as pure as the day they were born. So would I know if my Hajj was Mabrur or not? The answer is yes. It's quite simple actually to pick it up. Quite simple. How? Number one is that Hajj which was fulfilled in a way that your life changed when you returned is a hajj mabrur. Even if two, three aspects of your life have changed, but something changed big time. Ever since this man got back from hajj, he's not missing salah in the first saf, or he's always at the masjid. It was never like that before. Inshallah, hajj mabrur. Ever since this man got back or this woman got back, no more vulgar words, hajj mabrur. Ever since this uncle got back, no more smoking. Hajj mabrur. MashaAllah. May Allah make it easy. May Allah make it easy. And the reason why I mention it is, it is a bad habit. You know, here in this part of the world, when you talk about smoking, everyone looks at you. They look at you. Then they, it's like they're checking their pockets. My cigarette's still here, you know. But it is a bad habit. I'm, I, I feel honored to be able to speak about it. It's a bad habit. 
So if you can quit any bad habit and you have quit it and you notice it and you feel it and you've come back from Hajj and something has changed, good news to you. But if you came back and you straight back into the gambling, back into the pornography, back into the, the clubs and the pubs, back into the adultery, then what Hajj Mabrur was that? Your farad might be done, but I promise you something is wrong. You may not have to go back, but maybe you might think about it to go for another voluntary one. If Sahuk allows you, by the way. May Allah make it easy. I know of countries where they have to wait 20 years before they are accredited. So we are still not there. Some of us, I think the maximum is about five, six years, which is a lot, which is a lot. But it's getting there because more and more people can afford the trip. You go and apply for Hajj in Indonesia and other countries, you might have to wait for 30, 40 years in some cases. We're lucky. But I want to end the same way I started. What lessons did we learn from the Hajj? What lessons did we learn from coming together today in this masjid? Look at the colors. Every race is here. Ethnicities. I think almost every ethnicity is here. We are here in Cape Town. Subhanallah. It's holiday season. Most parts of the world. A lot of people are here from all over the globe. Don't we feel the love, the brotherhood? Don't we feel the goodness? If you don't clean your heart, clean your heart. Rid it of hatred. No, you don't hate the person. You might hate a deed. You love everyone. We will keep promoting that. The person who may be astray, totally far from the deen, within our hearts, we may dislike what they're doing, but we have a good hope and we would always reach out to them in the most loving way. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And the minimum, don't abuse people. That's why for the hajj to be rewarded, the hadith says, whoever goes for the hajj and doesn't commit immorality, is not abusive and doesn't uh, use his tongue in a negative way, that is the person who would actually have the hajj mabrur. Because the importance of it is such that your whole life should rotate around good words. Abstaining from bad words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. May Allah make it easy for those who are going and those who have gone. And even those who are remaining, may Allah make it easy for all of us. May Allah grant us goodness. May we be vehicles of spreading love and kindness. And may we understand the true meaning of unity. And that it is connected more to learning the respect of a difference rather than being exactly the same in everything. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.